Ryan's one of our board members and Helen is our uh, co co president. So um, Hope you enjoy tonight's program. I'm going to let Ryan talk about the Christmas bird count this year and also introduce our guest tonight. Great. Yeah, thank you, Maricela, and good to see everyone digitally. Um, yeah, so as you know, COVID has uh, thrown us all um, a loop here, but with guidelines from National Audubon Society, uh, we will be having a Christmas bird count here in the Ukiah area, although <clears throat> it will be drastically different than years prior. Uh, we will be encouraging people who live within the count circle to bird from home and work with your area leaders to get those observations um, to them within a day or two. And then I think what we're gonna do is have kind of a Zoom compilation um, tally. So that way everybody can see the results. There will be no in-person uh, dinner like normal. Um, and the area leaders will be working with a select few uh, individuals to cover the ground. But looking forward to having people participate at home. Um, just make sure to record your start and end times so we can get a unit of effort. And I will present more information about the Christmas bird count um, in December. I think it's December 16th, um, but I'll get back to you about that. Um, I'm also acting as the Kind of the host and moderator tonight so i'm letting some people in here uh but yeah we're very excited to have dr gordon walker um with us tonight he is from uc davis and i'm gonna hand it over to him and uh yeah excited he's here so hello everybody how you doing uh my name's gordon so we'll get we'll get going here uh, so I am a PhD trained biochemist. I'll tell you guys a little bit more about my background in a sec, but about three years ago, I started a mushroom account uh, called Fascinated by Fungi. And over the past three years, it has grown tremendously and I've gained access and opportunity to things that I, I never thought possible before, especially since I don't have an official background or training in mushrooms. I am just sort of just an enthusiast and as I often say, just a nerd with an iPhone and that's that's pretty much all I do. Um, but over over the last couple, three years, you know, several years, I have learned a tremendous amount about mushrooms and I'm going to share a little bit of what I've learned uh, with you guys. So bear with me. Um, oh, hang on. I wanted to talk about these pieces, wonderful pieces of art real quick before we got too far in. Uh, one of these is this lobster chef that my friend Lindley did for me. And another was this uh, waxy cap uh, parrot mushroom. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about waxy caps later in the talk, but these are two sort of logos I had me made recently and I'm, I'm just super proud of them. So I'm showing them off to you guys, but, <laughs> uh, and there's, there's me from last December uh, when my mom was visiting California and we found a whole bunch of bolites and it was really exciting because I'd never really found bolites like this before and I got to do it with my parents, which was uh, an absolute joy. Oh, and they're, they're here on the call, so hi guys. Uh, anyhow, so my background, uh, I am a Bostonian by birth, but really sort of a pseudo-Canadian. So if you hear some, you know, oots and boots in my speech, that's where it's coming from. Uh, I went to UC Santa Cruz for undergrad and I went to UC Davis for to get a, a PhD. And at Santa Cruz, I did uh, a biochemistry BS, but got really into home brewing. I, I did some scuba and some sailing and some other stuff, but home brewing became a, a major focus for me. And it got me really interested in yeast, which is a unicellular fungi that makes alcohol. So I went to UC Davis and did a PhD again in biochemistry because I could never really decide whether I wanted to split the line between chemistry and biology. So I stayed right in the middle of it. And I learned a heck of a lot about wine yeast and the way that yeast interact with bacteria and fermentation and how that affects wine quality and you know, beverage, you know, types of beverages you're making. So after that, I worked a, a couple harvests at Opus One, which is a very fancy winery, uh, but 
ultimately could not really find a, a job in the wine industry and realized, I think overall, I'm not super interested in working in wine. I'm far more interested in mushrooms. And this was a, a fascination that has been with me for a lifetime, but it went latent for a long time. So as a kid, I found you know a puffball, very large, the size of my head with my mom. And she knew enough to say, hey, I think this is edible, let's take it home. And my first bite of having cut that thing up and fried it off and the taste of this sort of savory marshmallow-like character you get from a puffball has stayed with me for a lifetime because I was like, wow, what, what is this? Can I find more? We've gone back to that field a bunch of times, never found another giant puffball, but the memory stays there. Uh, I had another sort of experience too. My dad plugged up a stump in the yard with this chicken of the woods spawn. And I think this came out of, he looked at what it would take to get a log removed or get a stump removed. And it was way more money than we wanted to pay. Uh, so he was like, you know, he's a biologist. He could think kind of critically and on his feet. And he said, well, maybe mushrooms can do it. And so we got this chicken of the woods mushroom. After two years, the, the stump kind of, you know, fizzled away, but we got these beautiful orange mushrooms, got one or two years of uh, flushes out of it. And that too sort of stayed with me for a lifetime of like, wow, there's this crazy, you know, yellow orange mushroom that tastes like chicken and is amazing. Uh, and then I became a preteen and immediately forgot about all things that I thought was cool as a kid. Uh, and sort of didn't think about mushrooms for about 20 years there. Um, I did, however, like I said, think about yeast. And so I got really into thinking about unicellular fungi and learned a lot about the biochemistry of fungi, their cell membranes, um, the reproductive cycles, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And it wasn't until I was in New Zealand in 2017, in between one of my internships at Opus One, where I found this mushroom, this Agrasibi parasitica. Uh, and it was a, it's related to piapini mushrooms, which grow here. Um, but in New Zealand, this Agraspi parasitica was the only mushroom that looked like that and would grow on trees and was edible. And so that gave me sort of a sense of confidence, a sense of safety that I was in New Zealand and I, I knew this one mushroom and I could be sure of it. And I find, started finding it more and more. I started eating it and that helped me build some confidence and kind of get into posting more and more photos of mushrooms because I had, you know, after a couple of months of living in New Zealand and going on hikes, I had hundreds of photos of mushrooms on my phone and said, what, what do I possibly do with these? So uh, we're gonna start wide and then we're gonna come down uh, to a point, but I wanna sort of show you guys this phylogenetic tree for all of life um, and help put fungi and mushrooms in context when we're thinking about how they relate to all the other organisms that are out there. Uh, we have sort of three, um, mega kingdoms, there's bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And for the most part, we're gonna just ignore these little unicellular bacteria and archaea. We're gonna think about you know, eukaryotes. Uh, here we've got stuff like slime molds, which I'm not gonna talk about slime molds because they're not technically mushrooms. They are actually protists, more similar to like an amoeba. Um, although slime molds live a very interesting lifestyle and in some ways they, their lifestyle is similar to what fungi do, uh, although they are sort of fundamentally and biologically different. You will hear from a lot of people when they say that animals are more like fungi than plants. And while that is technically true, I would say that fungi and animals are still very different. Uh, the similarity that animals and fungi have is they both use the polysaccharide chitin. And human beings don't use chitin and most mammals don't use chitin. It's a, it's a thing that's in shellfish and insects and it's part of their exoskeleton. And fungi use a little bit of chitin. They don't use as much chitin as like an insect does in its exoskeleton, but it's a component in their cell walls and the way that they build their cell walls. So there is some crosstalk between, you know, types of bugs and shellfish and, and mushrooms to some degree. Uh, to kind of zoom in, there are five of these phyla of mushroom, of fungi. Um, most of these, the glomeromycota, zygomycota, these are microscopic and they won't ever produce like a, a mushroom that we would sort of see. You could, you know, they're, they're important in a lot of ways in biology uh, as mycorrhizal things, partners with plants and so on. But we're going to focus primarily just on the citiomycota. And I don't think, I don't know if you even have any ascomycota, but stuff like morels and truffles are ascomycota. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is also an ascomycota, and that, that has to do with the way the spores are packaged. But most of the giant mushrooms that we recognize as mushrooms are going to be part of this basidiomycota phylum. Uh, so that's sort of very broad view of all life, and I'm going to show you guys more and more about these mushrooms as we go along. Uh, so here's sort of some basic biology about these fungi. 
uh, there are three sort of general lifestyles that they, you know, work with. Um, there's so saprophytic, which actually I should change the slide to saying saprobic. Um, saprophytic is a holdover term from when mushrooms were considered plants because mushrooms weren't even officially differentiated from plants by science until about the 1970s, which is a, a real shame and kind of underlies the fact that fungi for a lot of biological history have been very much, um, and that's partially because they are cryptic. The mycelium, which is the true body of a mushroom, lives in the ground. And the mushroom itself is more like a fruit or a flower that kind of comes up uh, when the mycelium has, you know, good conditions and it's it's sensing that its environment is ready to to disperse its spores. So these saprobic mushrooms, uh, which means eating dead stuff, as that's what mushrooms do, is they help cycle carbon and nitrogen back into the soils and digest plant matters. Uh, and so these saprobic mushrooms are going to be eating organic matter and recycling stuff back into the soil. There are parasitic mushrooms, which are preying on plants, preying on other fungi, and they're sucking you know, nutrients out. But there is some question now about what's truly parasitic versus maybe there's just an ebb and flow in the way that carbon goes. And you know, some of this stuff is still up for debate. And again, with the, the advent of DNA sequencing technologies, the hierarchy and phylogeny of mushrooms is changing almost on a daily basis as people are finding out, you know, sequencing things that have been part of the same family for 100 years and realizing that they're actually, you know, they look the same, but genetically, they're totally different. Um, and that's, that's pretty common in the world of mushrooms that things have convergent evolution where they end up looking similar, but end up having totally different backgrounds. And then finally, we have mycorrhizal mushrooms, which are living in association, happy symbiotic association uh, with plants. And you have, uh, it's not on this slide, but there's a differentiation between ectomycorrhizal, which is like large uh, mushrooms that form large fruiting bodies versus uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae, which are you know small sort of microscopic fungal associations that live on or in the roots sometimes and they don't produce giant mushrooms. But ecto ectomycorrhizal fungi are gonna be the big hitters, the ones we love talking about like porcinis and chanterelles and some things like that. So. Um, getting into, I'm not going to spend too long on this, the basics of biology, because I mostly just want to show you guys pretty pictures of mushrooms, but I just want to give you some context for, for what we're talking about here. So, so basidiomycetes, like I was talking about, are the sort of majority of these guild mushrooms. Um, their spores come on what are called basidia, which is kind of like a little club with the spores on the end of it. And that, that's where the spores are dispersed from the gills or, you know, on a polypore or something. And then there's ascomycetes, uh, where the spores are packaged in like a little, um, sack, basically, or the, you know, there's some sort of container, basically, it has the spores in it, and then the ascus has to get degraded, and the spores go out and form new mushrooms. But this is sort of the um, generalized life cycle for mushrooms, is there's mycelium, which is the body, they produce a uh, fruiting body, and, you know, getting rid of sexual spores, but a lot of fungi have the capacity to do uh, clonal reproduction as well. And so I included this little uh, mushroom down here, Dendrocolibia racemosa, uh, which is a really cool mushroom because it is both a telomorph and an anamorph at the same time. And that means it's doing sexual and asexual reproduction, which from the fungus's point of view, from the mushroom's point of view, is probably a way of hedging its bets, right? So the cap here is releasing uh, sexual spores that have gone through meiosis and the the little nubbins on the on the stipe are releasing asexual spores. So it's trying out both ways of reproducing at the same time, which I think is really cool. Not all mushrooms do that, but you know, it's just sort of an example that it, it can do both simultaneously. And I, I just, that blows my mind that fungi can do that. I, I think it's so interesting. So this is a big part of the reason that I'm fascinated by fungi because I, I just nerd out on this stuff really, really hardcore. Uh, <laughs> So this is this is one of the last slides I have that's sort of sciencey, and then we're just going to hop into pretty pictures of the mushrooms the rest of the night. So this is getting at some of the different life strategies, right? I mentioned uh, saprobic, parasitic, mycorrhizal. And this is kind of showing you on like a you know some sort of plot how things relate to each other. Uh, so with plant benefit, you know, maximized mycorrhizal associations are you know the mushrooms are basically in concert with, with their plant hosts um, and you're producing stuff like chanterelles and boletes. Um, 
there are endophytes. So these are fungal associations where the fungus ends up almost living inside, um, in between plant cells. And that's the arbuscular mycorrhizae. I mentioned a lot of those are like endophytes, um, but they end up providing sort of a innate immune system to the plant by inhabiting the space between the plant cells, it's stopping other invaders from coming in between those spaces. And often having the fungus there is also modifying uh, various aspects of plant metabolism and gene expression. And you know, endophytes can make a plant that would be super uh, sensitive to, to drought or temperature really resistant to those, you know, those abiotic stress factors. And so endophytes are, are super cool. And if I could go back and do a second PhD, I would probably go work on endophytes, but I'm, no one wants to do a second PhD. <laughs> too much time. Um, so you have pure parasitism. And I look at mushrooms like honey mushrooms. Our malaria species are a great example of parasitism. These are really killer mushrooms. They have uh, weaponized mycelium called rhizomorphs, which are like little black tendrils which move through the soil and will creep up in a tree between the bark and the body of the tree. And it will end up girdling because it separates the bark and kind of interferes with the flow of the xylem and phloem. So it girdles the tree, kills the tree, and then it decides to eat the tree. And so these armillaria mushrooms, uh, you know, I get hundreds of photos of people sending me this every year saying, what are these? What are these? I found them on a stump in my yard or I found them on the tree in my yard. And I have to sort of tell them like, if you found this in a tree in your yard, that, that tree's dead. You know, it's, it's going to die and you should be careful because all the other trees around it, that, that rhizomorphs will creep out and kill those trees too. So much so that armillaria are known as meadow makers because they kind of mow down forests. And actually the, the world's largest contiguous organism is a giant patch that's several miles wide of armillaria mycelium that's only you know a couple inches deep, but it's up in Oregon and I think it might even span a couple of states kind of thing. So um, it's all pretty wild. And you have, uh, you have some plant pathogens, uh, stuff like wheat lacoche or what's called corn smut as we know it here in the United States. Uh, in Mexico, it is revered as a delicacy. And in the United States, we spray unbelievable amounts of pesticides or of, uh, fungicides every year to prevent this from happening. And I think that's a shame because uh, it is absolutely delicious. And you know, we could be eating this stuff and gaining the benefit from it instead of killing all the mycelium in our fields by spraying fungicides everywhere. Um, you got stuff like the cedar apple rust, which is just really cool looking, which is why I put it in here. Um, you've got fungi that prey on other fungi. You'll see frequently on sort of older mushrooms, they get a, a film of hypomyces and it kind of turns them bitter and edible. Um, or these little powder top things uh, that grow on like old moldy rustlas. Um, and then you've got mycoheterotrophs. So these are really interesting plants that are non-photosynthetic plants that will uh, feed, get their carbon from the mycelium below, but they're not actually doing any photosynthesis. So the mushroom is associated with like a tree and the tree's carbon is going down to the mycelium. And then this other plant is then tapping into that mycelium to take the carbon. So it's a, sort of, it's a big web. And for a long time, it was thought that these microheterotrophic plants were purely parasitic. And now they're realizing there's a lot more crosstalk uh, between where the carbon and nitrogen is flowing and then the fact that they're all sort of buffering each other. So rather than just you know, taking this very reductive approach to biology where we view everything as you know, one single thing, uh, we're starting to recognize that everything really is connected. And I say that not in sort of a hippy dippy kind of way, but in a very serious, like we can watch the flow of nitrogen and carbon uh, between these things in the, in the forest floor. So, okay. So we're gonna get into the California fall winter mushroom season. And this is, is certainly a wonderful uh, state to live in for lots of mushrooms. And it's nice because I talked to a lot of people on the East Coast and they're like, yeah, my season is kind of coming into an end. And I'm like, well, mine's, mine's about to begin. Uh, we just needed some rain and, and we finally got it. So that's a good thing. Uh, you can find some stuff in summer. Uh, this year was particularly dry along the coast, which is a real shame. But usually in the summer, there's a lot of fog drip. And so, you know, even in August, I found like a pretty nice big edible mushroom uh, up in Jackson State Forest. And I kept going back for a couple of months, but it was just too dry. And if there'd been more fog, there might've been more stuff. But this fall and winter season is definitely driven by the rain and also driven by, you know, fog and continuing to have lots of moisture around, but it can be inhibited by cold. And that was an issue last year uh, where we didn't get rain up until it got really cold. 
and it kind of delayed the start of mushroom season by a couple of weeks in in weird ways. I went out and found a bunch of chanterelles that were like frozen solid. Uh, they were okay. <laughs> they were not as good as if they had been frozen. So we have uh, access to some great habitat here in California, specifically on like the Sonoma and Mendocino coast. Uh, there's a lot of dug fir, tan oak, madrone. Uh, there's redwoods. There's, you know, there's a great diversity of tree species. And that biodiversity of trees really helps feed into a lot of biodiversity of mushrooms and sort of variety of habitat. Uh, in, this, in this photo here, I've got uh, what's called the winter trio, which is yellowfoot chanterelles, black trumpets, and hedgehogs. So these are three uh, great mushrooms you can find out during the winter. Um, this is sort of a smattering of other stuff. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about most of the mushrooms that you can see here. So we'll, we'll learn about them as we go along. So chanterelles are probably arguably the best known wild foraged mushroom that's out there. Um, when we talk about chanterelles, I'm talking about the cantharellus genus. Uh, so these are great edible mushrooms. They're pretty meaty. They're pretty easy to identify. Um, they're mycorrhizal with sort of specific trees and different species have preferences for different trees. Uh, in terms of IDing them, they are known for having false gills or sort of ridges instead of true gills. And it's hard to really explain what that's like other than to say, here's a picture of it. And maybe if you find one, run your finger along it because these ridges are far more solid than an actual gill. A gill will kind of fold and bend and break. Whereas these ridges are, you know, more like they feel like the flesh in the mushroom itself. Uh, so what you're looking at here is you've got on the bottom, these are all Cantharellus formosus. So these are ones that I tend to find under Doug fir and Sitka spruce. Uh, this white one is the Cantharellus subalbatus. And I find that, um, I guess I found it with pine and maybe oak trees. I, chanterelles love to associate with lots of different trees. So it's kind of hard to peg down exactly which one's associated with which. Um, I will say that this is this one here is the Cantharellus californicus, um, affectionately known as the mud puppy. Uh, so these do tend to associate with hardwoods and oaks in particular, and they uh, are very muddy. They're very dirty. Um, they're not my favorite edible, but they tend to be huge. So if you find a couple, you're probably going to find a, a couple of pounds worth of them. Um, so again, these have those ridges, they have white spores, and you should be aware that they do have some, some lookalikes. Um, so there's the false chanterelle and the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And I'll show you guys some pictures of those too, so you can start to draw the differences um, between them. So this is, this is that false chanterelle I mentioned. Um, Hygophoropsis orantica, I think is the, is the scientific name. Um, so it's, it's very orange. It has real gills, uh, i.e. gills that you can kind of like stroke your finger along, you can feel them fold and bend. Um, they are saprobic as opposed to being mycorrhizal. Um, you'll find them a lot in duff uh, growing on, you know, decaying hardwoods and in conifer. Um, they also have kind of these decurrent gills. And that's one of the things that chanterelles are, are known for having is gills that kind of run down the stipe. And these have it too, except the real gills versus ridges. Um, you know, these tend to have a little bit of like an inrolled margin on the cap. Um, to me, they're far more orange than any chanterelle I've ever seen. Uh, and, and that's just, it's a function of, you have to kind of go out and find these things and look, look for them. But I guarantee you, if you were ever to sit down and hold a chanterelle and one of these false chanterelles in hand, uh, you would very quickly be able to tell the difference between the tactile sensation, the smell, the feel of the mushroom, um, the habitat you find them in, that kind of stuff. So it's, Again, people are always asking me, how do I tell the difference between poisonous versus edible? And the best thing I can say is you, you got to go practice. Some of the stuff is just experience being out there. And I can, I have sort of a visual fingerprint for these things that I can look at it and say, I know exactly what that is. But it's because I've seen a lot of photos of it and I've developed kind of a mental Rolodex of, of images and, and what things look like. Um, but again, you know, practice is the best way to do that. Look a lot of photos of mushrooms, look at your ID guides, use Facebook forums, use a, a thing like iNaturalist, which is a great app you can download and use on your phone to help you ID stuff. So these are all things you can do to help you, you know, start getting used to IDing mushrooms. Um, another great genre of edible mushrooms are craterellus. So these are ed excellent edible mushrooms. They're plentiful. They're pretty easy to ID. Uh, the ones we see here in California are the yellowfoot chanterelle on top here. 
and black trumpets, which are on the bottom. And, and then these black trumpets are not exactly uh, typical looking. This, this one here is like the largest, most impressive black trumpet I've ever seen with a huge long stipe. Usually you see them like this kind of growing uh, in the duff and you basically can't see them until you almost step on them. But usually once you find some, you'll find more nearby and they tend to associate with tan oak. Whereas these yellowfoot chanterelles, I think are technically mycorrhizal, but I've also found them growing uh, saprobically. And a lot of mushrooms will do that. Like I mentioned, um, the armillaria mushrooms can like shift from being kind of like this invasive thing to then eating a whole dead tree. These uh, craterellus yellow feet seem to be able to be both mycorrhizal and saprophytic, depending on, you know, what life cycle or what sort of strategy suits them at the time. Um, but these are both great edible mushrooms. They're part of that winter trio that I mentioned. Uh, they're easy to identify. They have sort of hollow stems and you know, there's, there's, again, you can just go out and find oodles and oodles of these things when it's, when it's the right season. So they're very plentiful. Um, you'll see black trumpets sold in stores. You don't usually see yellow feet sold in stores, which is a shame, but I think it's because commercial pickers get like 50 cents a pound for yellow feet. They're, they're so plentiful that they, they just don't have a lot of value. Um, I think for home chef, they do, but again, they can be a lot of work. You, you go out, you get a bunch of them, they're covered in pine needles and fur needles, and you got to wash them out, break them apart. Uh, but that being said, both of these craterless species are really good for both savory applications as well as sweet applications. So I've done stuff like make candied yellow feet and, you know, uh, onion jam or sweet jams with black trumpets and, and they're, it's all fantastic. So those are definitely some of my favorite edibles. Next, we've got hedgehog mushrooms or hydnum species. Uh, so these are known as hedgehog mushrooms because they have little spines underneath. They have these little, you know, spines or teeth. And these are mycorrhizal with hardwoods and conifer. Um, I'm not calling out the specific species because we have sort of a, two basic clades. There's like the larger uh, hydnum rapandums, which are kind of like this, this one on the right here. It's a little more woody, a little bit bigger, more solid. And then we have these little sort of what are called belly button hedgehogs. And they've recently changed the species name for this as, as sequencing has happened. And I think there's like a, a gradient of this species as it kind of goes up and down the West Coast. Um, but whatever species it is, they're edible, they're easy to ID, uh, they will last for weeks on end in the fridge, which I can't say for most other mushrooms. Uh, these hedgehogs are some of the best in terms of the way they keep in the fridge. And, and so for me, that's, that's worth it. Cause I, you know, if I go up and I harvest several pounds, I can eat them slowly over the next couple of weeks rather than having to process them all right away. So, and they have, they have absolutely amazing flavor and texture. I'd say they're on par with any chanterelle I've had. If, if not, I think I might actually like them better than most chanterelles. So that's, that's just my two cents. Okay, uh, another big favorite that people love to go look for is candy cap. And this is Lactarius rubidus. Uh, so these are sort of beautiful, rusty, orangey looking little uh, Lactarius. And there's a lot of different Lactarius species. I didn't, I had slides on it and I, I had to sort of delete it because I'm trying to just give you guys a, a broad overview. But the way you can identify this Lactarius versus other Lactarius that look similar, and there are several that look similar, is all about the nose. It's got a very distinctive smell. And that's because these candy caps, uh, Lactarius rubidus, contain a, what's called a quaba lactone, which is a mouthful. But basically, when you dry it out, it gets hydrolyzed into this lactone called sodalon. So lactones are a class of volatile molecule that have sort of warm, round flavors. Think of vanilla. Vanilla is your classic lactone. And sodalon is a lactone that smells like maple syrup. And it really, really reeks of maple syrup. So if you have a candy cap, you're going to be able to tell it's a candy cap because it's going to smell like maple syrup. If it smells ambiguously like anything else, it's probably not a candy cap. Uh, and I think this is really cool because sodalon is also present in maple syrup. It's present in fenugreek, it's present in sherry. So there's a bunch of you know, products out there that all share the same aromatic compound and have this kind of maple-like smell. Um, but it is, it's a phenomenal mushroom for using a sort of a seasoning. So people will put it, you know, imbue it into cheesecakes or shortbreads to make it maple flavored. I've had maple flavored scones made with candy caps. I've also used it in curries. And there's some areas of the world where maple is not considered a sweet flavor, but considered more of a savory flavor. And so using candy caps in that kind of cuisine is, is kind of fun and interesting. But definitely beware, there are some other uh, lactaria species that look fairly similar. 
Um, there's one that grows with oak here, like in the internal valleys here in Napa called Lactarius rufulus. And that one's edible. It's, it's a little bit chalkier and its maple fiber isn't quite as strong, but it's, it's plenty edible. Um, the one you want to look out for is there's a Lactarius whose latex um, stains kind of yellow, uh, Lactarius xanthogalactans or something like that. And you want to avoid that one. That one is no good. It'll make you make you sick if you eat it. So, so always beware with your candy caps to like check the bottoms and see if it's staining yellow at all. And if it is, toss it. It's not, not a candy cap. Uh, here's another interesting one. This occurs a little bit earlier in the season. And I'm not sure how much of it is still around as you know the rains kind of come. Uh, I found some of these up in Humboldt back in August, and I haven't seen a ton of them around the Mendocino area and down to the Sonoma Coast, but I know they do exist. And this mushroom is really interesting because it's actually a base mushroom that's been infected by a mold. And so this is, uh, it is a great edible mushroom. They tend to be pretty plentiful when you find them. And it's a Rusla or a Lactarius base species. And those are both mycorrhizal mushrooms associated with, you know, usually conifers. Um, and as the mushroom is developing in the soil, it gets spores from this mold, which is in the soil, infecting the mushroom. And the mold takes over the mushroom. Uh, it, it dives several, you know, centimeters deep into the mushroom flesh, uh, where it's actually injecting its own DNA kind of into the mushroom and taking over the gene expression and changing the metabolic profile and the gene expression profile, which results in changes to sort of the texture and the flavor of the mushroom. And it turns the mushroom into this really bright, vibrantly bright orangey red uh, mushroom that, that when it gets a little older has a real definitive seafood funk to it, which is not always pleasant uh, as, as old seafood might not be pleasant. Uh, but it is, when it is young, it improves the flavor because generally those Russula and Lactarius tend to be pretty gritty, grainy. And when it gets infected with the Hypomyces lactiflorum, it, it really tightens up the texture and makes it more meaty and, and kind of toothy, which is, which is pleasant. And I included this photo uh, on the bottom here because you can actually see, almost see the individual pits. And each one of those little pits is where Hypomyces is has sort of a little invaginated pit and it's producing its spores in there. So the spores are coming off of the surface of these infected red mushrooms. Whereas the, the actual like base species of Russell lactarius has been sort of parasitically castrated by the mold, uh, which I think is, is really cool. And I, I owe that, that terminology to my friend Mikhail from, from Soma, who hopefully is here on the call somewhere. But um, yeah, these lobster mushrooms are, are absolutely wild looking and they're pretty good edible. Um, so I you know, encourage people to check them out. And as far as I know, regardless of the base or lactaria species that's infected, I don't think it, even if they're ones that aren't great to eat, I don't think that there's a toxic version of a uh, lobster mushroom out there. So I think, <laughs> can always be wrong. There's always exceptions to the rule with fungi. So uh, another really common one that people will find are oyster mushrooms. Um, these are really good, easy to grow at home, but you'll find lots of them out in nature too. So this is uh, in California, we have Pleurotus, uh, pulmonaris, which is sort of generally seen as like a summer oyster, but I think that seems to be the predominant species of what we see here in California, as opposed to Pleurotus uh, ostriata, or sort of the more traditional oyster mushroom that people think of. But so these are, are good edible. They're usually pretty easy to identify. They're very common. They are saprobic white rot fungi, and white rot fungi are ones that can digest lignin in the wood. So wood is composed of lots of parallel fibers of cellulose. Uh, which is what makes up plant matter. And then lignin is kind of the cross-linker between all these like parallel bands of cellulose. Lignin cross-links it all. And that's what gives wood its structural stability, makes it really, really strong. Once you start degrading the lignin, uh, the cellulose can kind of flake apart more easily. And there's, there's other fungi called brown rot fungi, I'll talk about those, that digest specifically the cellulose versus the lignin. So usually you'll get like a white rot fungi, then a brown rot fungi, and then sort of a decomposer fungi. So there's sort of three levels of of saprobic fungi as they, they digest stuff. So oyster mushrooms are really cool to me because they use these little microscopic lassos that they inject into the wood and they wait for sort of a nematode, which are little worms that live in the wood to swim through. And if they hit the lasso, the lasso tightens and sucks them in and sucks them dry of nitrogen because wood is not a particularly good source of nitrogen. So these mushrooms have learned how to hunt. And you'll actually see this kind of behavior with multiple types of white rot fungi 
uh, that grow grow well because they are able to adapt to lower nitrogen conditions because they're actually actively able to hunt uh, insects from their environment and get extra nitrogen. So I, I again, I think that's really cool. But uh, oyster mushrooms have white spores. They have these kind of decurrent gills. Um, you want to be careful that you're not accidentally picking a crepidotus species. So oyster mushrooms tend to have a, a true stipe. There's a real stem and you can trace it all the way back to the wood. Uh, whereas crepidotus species are usually much smaller. They kind of look like an oyster, but they lack any true stem. Um, and crepidotus aren't toxic. They're just not great to eat. It's kind of like the false chanterelle. You're not, it's not that bad if you do eat it, but you probably don't want to. Um, and again, it's always a good idea to check multiple sources, use Facebook forums, get a lot of people to give you a sense of what something is before we ever even think about eating it. Um, and even it's a good idea to find mushrooms in the same place several times and have them ID'd multiple times before you even consider kind of eating something so that you're always minimizing your risk. Right. This is the pig's ear or gomphus clavitus. Oops, this should be a lowercase c, but uh, it's, a, it's a decent edible mushroom. It's very common. It tends to fruit in large clusters. Uh, it's mycorrhizal with conifers. Uh, and like I said, yeah, it's decent when it's not ruined by bugs. It does tend to have, be relatively full of bugs. But one of the strategies I've taken to cooking this mushroom is to just cut it into strips kind of along the, the length of the mushroom. And I'll just boil it for like five minutes or something like that. And you can knock out a lot of the internal bugs and any other crud that's on there. And once you've boiled it, it's, it its texture tightens up a little bit. And then you can toss it in stir fries or soups or you know anything else you'd, you'd cook with a mushroom. It doesn't have a whole lot of flavor, but it's a pretty good filler mushroom. And like I said, you tend to find lots of it. Um, so it's, it's a good one. If you have an empty basket and you wanna go home with something, this is, this is a fine one. Um, it's also when it's young, it's really beautiful because the underside has this gorgeous kind of purple sheen to it. And it, it has the same kind of decurrent looking gills as like a chanterelle. So it used to be classified as a chanterelle and they realized it was genetically different, but it had the same sort of, you know, ridges and current ridges that ran down. Um, clearly it's a different color. So hopefully you don't confuse it with a chanterelle, but it, people used to call it a purple chanterelle too. So there's, there's some commonalities there. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, probably one of the most high value mushrooms and we're gonna get into boletes. But boletes can be kind of hard to spot. So I want to show you guys some of the things to look for when you're out in coastal pine forests. Specifically, Bishop Pine is a great place to be looking for boletes. Um, starting about now, for the next month or so, you're, it's going to be bolete season. And you're going to find boletes really deeply buried in the duff in pine, often in little shrumps, which means they're sort of a, a slight bump in the pine duff, but otherwise you're not going to see anything. And unless you're really keyed into that, you might have a hard time noticing it's there. So what you can do is you can look for these indicator species. So look for the fly agaric, Amanita muscaria, which is the most recognizable mushroom in the world. And anywhere you are, it catches your eye because it's red and white and it's a, it's a real shower. Um, in its own right, Amanita muscaria is actually a pretty good edible mushroom. Uh, it is toxic, but not deadly toxic. And it's toxic because it contains this compound called ibotenic acid, which can give you pretty severe cramps and diarrhea and vomiting and stuff like that if you if you were to eat it raw. And even if you cook it up, it still has a fair bit of ibotenic acid. So what you can do is you can take the Amanita muscaria and boil it twice for about five to 10 minutes in salted water. And after you do that, you've leached out a lot of ibotenic acid and you can prepare it kind of like you would a normal mushroom. And that's Amanita, Amanitas generally have really nice sort of meaty texture. Um, there's a chef, uh, Chef Chad Hyatt who makes a, a ceviche with uh, Amanita muscaria, that's, that's really good. So you look for Amanita muscaria. You can also look for the spy mushroom, which is this little white um, Clitopilus prunulus. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, but it, it has a very distinctive odor as well. It's said to be kind of farinaceous, which is a fancy way of saying it smells kind of like cereal grainy, um, maybe like a grain silo. Um, and I've heard that it's actually a, an okay edible in its own right. Uh, but I think the bigger thing is people like to look for these mushrooms because when they are in the habitat with bishop pine and they see these mushrooms, they know they should be extra careful to look for those little shrumps and, you know, look for the, the, the porcini, the king boletes. So that's, that's what these are. And in California, we have, we have three different kinds, but we're talking about the fall and winter season here. Um, so we're boletus edilis 
And there's Boletus edilis var edilis, and that's mycorrhizal with Sitka spruce. Um, so that's more Northern. And I have, I've only seen this in Humboldt and, and North of there. Um, down in Mendocino and in Sonoma, I have mostly seen Boletus edilis var grand edilis, and that's mycorrhizal with the, the Bishop pine. Um, so I don't think there's any huge difference in terms of flavor, texture. They're both really good. Um, this is probably the most sought after mushroom in some ways in California. People absolutely love this. Uh, I personally find it a little bitter when prepared straight up. You know, if you fry them in a pan, I get bitterness out of it. So I like to dry them primarily and turn them into a porcini powder. Um, I also had pretty good luck last year with frying a bunch in pan and then just freezing it. And when I thawed it out, it didn't have that bitter character anymore. And I was able to you know, put it on cheese toast or in pastas and pizzas and stuff like that. So it's, it's a phenomenal mushroom. It has a really great meaty texture. Um, most people love the flavor. So it's, it's definitely high end mushroom that people are looking for. And people are looking for these little buttons. These are the ones that have kind of the most crisp texture. Um, but I do like these larger specimens because when you dry these, the, the more the pores have kind of gotten a chance to mature, the, the deeper the porcini flavor is when you dry it out because a lot of that umami is kind of locked away in those pores. And as you dry it out, it becomes available and really hits your tongue when you turn it into a powder. So this is, this is the king of mushrooms here in California. Um, we do, there is a spring species called uh, Boletus rex veris that occurs with fir trees up in alpine habitat. So that's, you get another chance at finding king boletes if you don't find them during the winter. And then there's Matsutake, uh, or Tricholoma murillianum. Um, and this is a absolutely top-notch edible. Uh, it is super highly valued in Japan. And there's, a, you know, there's commercial mushroom hunters who go out and find these Matsutake, um, sometimes in this phase where they haven't even opened up kind of the veil and they're still closed and they will sell those at a premium to people in Japan. Um, here in California, they're mycorrhizal with tan oak primarily, and I think as you move further north, they become mycorrhizal with pine. And they can be kind of tricky to ID. Um, usually as a beginning mushroom hunter, you're told to avoid any mushrooms that have uh, white gills. And that's really good advice because you can make a mistake with multiple mushrooms. Um, I have found the way to identify Matsutake most um, sincerely is just with smell. And again, it's kind of like the candy cap. Uh, the smell of a Matsutake, once you've smelled it, is absolutely unmistakable. Nothing else in the forest smells like that. It has this incredible kind of like high note, um, slightly chemically, but like almost sort of floral and fruity. Um, some people describe it as having a seafood cinnamon-like aroma. Um, so it has some sort of spice. It has some funk to it. Um, it's, a, it's a really amazing mushroom, but you'll find it usually buried sort of in the duff, uh, maybe with a little bit of a white cap popping out. And it's these uh, mushrooms also, when you pull them up, will generally have sort of a sandy pit in the soil. And that's another thing you can do to really make sure that the ID is what you think it is. Because if you're pulling up a, a white rustla or something else, it's not going to have this sort of sandy, sandy bits at the bottom. Uh, and but again, the smell is going to be the thing that you really key into. Um, but these, these Mansutake can be kind of kind of hard to find they can be a little elusive and i've certainly i haven't keyed into really knowing how to find them yet other than being aware that they associate with tan oaks but sometimes you know you just walk through habitat and you just don't know where to look you don't even know where to start but this is where going on hikes outside of mushroom season can be useful because matsutake associate with a microheterotrophic plant called a sugar stick allotropa virgata so this is a non-photosynthetic plant, like I was talking about earlier. Here's this beautiful photo of it. Um, it looks kind of like a candy cane, just the name, sugar stick. And it specifically associates uh, slash feeds off of Matsutake mycelium. And so if you see the sugar stick flower, that can serve as an indicator of where Matsutake will fruit uh, in mushroom season. And it's a, it's a great you know, reason to go out and explore coastal tan oak habitats in, you know, in spring when you're not gonna find Matsutake, but you can find this, uh, this flower, which will tell you where, inform you where you should go look for Matsutake next year. And here's a little diagram on you know, some of the um, exchange that microheterotrophs and mushrooms and, and plants go through. And I think for a long time, like I said, it was thought to be sort of a purely parasitic relationship and now they're realizing throughout a year that there can be ebb and flow of carbon from you know one direction to another. 
And to me, it seems like the more microheterotrophs there are in an area, the more density of mushrooms you get fruiting. So there must be some sort of positive feedback between having the microheterotrophs and the mycelium and you know the trees all there together. Um, but in Japan, uh, I said that masataki were extremely valuable. And they're extremely valuable because they're getting rare. And it's sort of a, it's an issue because this is like a very culturally important mushroom, very, you know, there's ceremonies based around it. There's, you know, a whole pomp and circumstance that happens every year when they kind of start fruiting. And harvests have been steadily declining. And it seems that it's largely due to habitat loss and then also the threat of invasive pests. There's a, there's like a pine boar or something like that uh, that's wreaking havoc on their pine forests and killing a lot of the trees. Just like here in California, we're having issues with our bishop pines being uh, absolutely wrecked by this cryptoporous uh, fungus and a, and a pine beetle uh, that's invasive. So the scientists were sort of curious if they could stimulate mushrooms with artificial lightning because there was a lot of anecdotal evidence and sort of maybe cultural uh, stories around the idea that, that lightning could, could spur more mushrooms. So they did this really interesting exper uh, experiment where they went around with sort of a little portable lightning rig, basically. They were able to sort of like give a, a certain amount of electricity as a shock into the ground. And they did this across a set of control plots and you know, non-control plots and uh, were you know, fairly rigorous about it. And what they saw was that going around and doing lightning strikes on the forest floor resulted in larger mushrooms. Um, they got you know, almost 60, 70% larger mushrooms and more fruitings. And after several fruitings, they were continuing to see larger mushrooms. Um, so I thought that was, that was really interesting. And there is, there's some really cool stuff in there that we haven't really totally figured out about the way that mushrooms and mycelium are able to perceive and potentially send electrical impulses almost like neurons in the brain. Um, if anyone's interested in reading more about that, I would definitely suggest checking out Merlin Sheldrake's uh, Entangled Life book because he writes about some of that stuff and it's, it's super fascinating. So, um, and this, you know, this is, this is in a published paper. This is not, you know, hearsay. This is, you can go read about it. And, you know, experiment was done and I'm sure someone is, in Japan has commercialized this. There might even be someone here in the States who's trying to commercialize this, who knows. Uh, another of my sort of favorite mushrooms that I see all over the place, and I guarantee you guys have seen and completely ignored, are these uh, split gill mushrooms or schizophyllum commune. So they tend to grow in massive numbers on decaying hardwoods. Um, they're edible, they're common, and they're easy to ID. And they're called split gills because underneath they have these little gills that will, when it's wet, they open up and free spores or let spores out. And when it's dry, the gills shut. And so they're, they're some of the longest lived fruiting bodies that are out there and they can continue to like do that kind of open and close thing with moisture uh, over many months. And I would say they, I first tried them as an edible when I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago and was really impressed and I've eaten them several times here and they're definitely better when you catch them young and they're still kind of growing actively rather than like an old leathery one. Uh, but they're, Again, they're another thing you can toss in your back at, basket if you're not finding anything else. Um, one of my favorite sort of factoids about this mushroom is it has almost 23,000 genders. Um, and mushrooms don't really have genders in a traditional sense that, you know, we as animals and humans like to think about gender. Uh, instead, they have what are called mating type loci. Uh, so in yeast, there's an A and an alpha mating type lo loci. And two A's together can't mate and two alphas together can't mate. You have to have an A and an alpha spore, and then they'll, they'll make what's called a shmoo, and they kind of connect with each other, and then a yeast forms. Um, and so Schizophyllum commune has over 23,000 of these mating type loci or genders, and I just think that's sort of a, a mind-blowing number. Um, and if you think about the fungal dating scene, it, it probably gets a little complicated. <laughs> um, but that, that is a, a decent edible mushroom, and certainly one you can keep an eye out for. And then this is one that I wouldn't recommend that people go look for it, but it is it's famous um, and it's famous partially because it lives in infamy uh, because even you know people, experienced mushroom hunters have picked what they thought was this mushroom and end up being a toxic mushroom and dying because some of the amanitas contain amatoxins which are heat stable uh, toxins that will bind to proteins in your liver and just wreck your liver basically. Uh, so I don't recommend looking for amanita calyptoderma 
but I have found it a bunch of times and I now feel comfortable enough that I would consider eating it. Problem is I did eat some last year, uh, this one here with the knife beside it, and it tasted awful. It tasted like mud. Uh, and that's partially because I found it sitting in mud on a, on a hillside with a bunch of oaks. And this one to the right here that I found a couple of years ago in Mendocino was in like conifer forests and looked really dry. And I bet that one would have tasted pretty good, but this one tasted terrible. So I think that the, uh, the flavor of this calyptoderma is gonna be kind of dependent on the habitat and then potentially the preparation. Uh, you can identify the calyptoderma. You know, again, I don't recommend going out and doing this if you don't have a lot of confidence and experience with this, but some of the things you can use to identify calyptoderma is these striations on the edge of the cap. They will always be visible, no matter how old or young the mushroom is. Uh, it has a thick white universal veil or cotton top or you know, skull cap, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and that veil will sort of peel off fairly easily. Uh, it's got a partial veil on the stem, a little annulus there. And it has this sort of hollow pithy stem. And you can see that in the bottom right here, then you cut it in half, it's got, it's hollow and there's sort of pithy stuff in it. So, those are all things you can use to to identify it, um, and I know that you know this is this is one that like Italians love this mushroom. Um, I'm not totally sold on the flavor, uh, but you know just what it is. So Cocora. <laughs> okay, so here is kind of an interesting um, relationship I wanted to highlight for you guys. It's the Suillus and Gomphidius and Krugogomphus. Um, so these are host mycelium is going to be the Suillus. These are sort of the slippery jack mushrooms. Um, there's some pictures of Suillus on top and they're associated. Uh, these are both Gumphidius and then this is a Krugogumphus on the on the bottom right. Uh, and this is basically the Suillus are in my association with the trees and the uh, Gumphidius and Krugogumphus are parasites on the mycelium, on the Suillus mycelium. And it can be kind of tricky to identify some of the, the differences between these uh, Gumphidius and Krugogomphus species unless you know what Suillus species is growing nearby because they all have sort of a specific host that they, they like to prey upon. Um, and these mushrooms are all edible but not necessarily great edibles. Um, they can be kind of slimy and I don't know, their flavors hit or miss. Um, I do sometimes eat these uh, Suillus cerulescens, they're the ones here, um, because I find lots and lots of them, and I think they taste okay. <laughs> uh, here is one called the woolly chanterelle, or the Turbinellus flocosus. Uh, it is a marginal edible, but really considered mildly toxic, and that's because it contains this uh, alpha tetra dicyclic citric acid, I don't know how to say that, but anyhow, uh, you will see tons of this stuff and you'll see it like in big fairy rings, you'll see big robust mushrooms. It looks like a chanterelle, it excites you because you think it's a chanterelle. Um, they're abundant, they're mycorrhizal here with conifers. They eat them in Mexico, they eat them in India. Uh, I don't know if they have a slightly different kind or maybe people have a resistance to this um, organic acid. Uh, I, I have talked to Alan Rockefeller, who is a fairly accomplished mycologist, and he said that when he was in Mexico, he decided to eat a bunch of these to see if he could actually, you know, he ate some and felt pretty good, felt fine. So he was like, oh, I'm going to keep eating it until I feel, feel not good. And he did. And apparently he had diarrhea for a couple of days. So I wouldn't recommend pushing it. But if you ever want to try this mushroom, it probably won't kill you to have, you know, one. And I'm, I plan on trying it this season just to kind of know what it tastes like. But be beware not to eat too much, um, especially not too much in one sitting. So some other amazing mushrooms you'll see out there are these coral fungi, Romaria. Um, there's a lot of biodiversity. Uh, most of them are not edible. Uh, this one red one is, this is Romaria ariospora, and that is an edible one. I've tried it, it's good. Uh, I'd say it's probably the only Romaria I would eat with confidence would be this very bright red one. It's because it's fairly easy to identify. A lot of the other ones, Romaria tend to fade fairly quickly after you pick them, and that kind of makes it hard to ID them. But generally, they're, they're mycorrhizal, and there's a whole lot of different kinds out there, um, and they really have an amazing diversity of colors and shapes, and they're, they're certainly some of my favorite sort of indicator species of, of other good stuff. If you see Romaria happening, you know that other things will be happening too. And then there's uh, the web caps or Cortinarius. And Cortinarius is, is really the, the most diverse genus of mushrooms. There are 
I don't know, over 2000 species of Cortinarius alone. There's, there's tons and tons of these. And generally they're, they're mycorrhizal. Um, there's lots of different morphologies. I have a real affinity for these kind of purple Cortinarius. There's, there's orange ones, there's red ones, there's brown ones, there's a lot of different colors, but these purple ones are the ones that kind of speak to me. Um, and they're called web caps because the, the partial veil as they're opening up tends to have this very sort of webby, webby texture. And that's what helps you define them as, as being a Cortinarius. Um, there's only a couple species that are potentially edible uh, and their flavor is kind of meh. And there's several species that are toxic and or deadly toxic. So generally people don't eat Cortinarius. Um, there is one species that's collected. Um, it's called a gypsy mushroom. That's kind of a troublesome name. So we're, I think the mycology community is trying to come up with a, a better name for that one. But um, Cortinarius are just cool looking. That's why I put them in here. <laughs> Uh, and then there's waxy caps. So these are hygrosibi. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning, I had that parrot mushroom uh, art that I commissioned. And this little, this little green guy here is, is a parrot mushroom. Um, but you can see that they're, they're really gooey. They're what are called viscid. And that's kind of the gooey, slimy texture. Um, I love the gills of these because they are just, they're so elegant, so beautiful. Um, I have a little like strap on macro lens for my camera that I just kind of put on and I like go down into a mushroom and that's, that's where some of these shots are from. Um, generally, these hygroscopies are considered to be saprobic, but there's some sort of emerging evidence that actually they might be sort of symbiotic with a host plant almost as like an endophyte. And that's where, you know, it really bleeds a line between what's saprobic versus what's mycorrhizal versus like what are mushrooms that can do both kind of facultatively depending on what their life cycle is. Um, in Europe, they find a lot of hygroscopy in wax in like, uh, sorry, in um, fields, in meadows. And here in California, I, most of the hygroscopy I see are in, in the forest. So I think it's kind of interesting that I don't generally see these in meadows, whereas in Europe, that's primarily the habitat that they inhabit. So they, they may be associating with different types of plants or, or feeding on different types of substrate. And a lot of hygroscopy are edible, uh, but they're not generally consumed as food because they're pretty small, they're pretty slimy, they're a little viscid. Um, and you know, there's, there's better mushrooms out there to eat. Um, but there's a, there's a few that could potentially be sort of interesting. And there's, there's a lot of diversity in California too. So I highly encourage you to go out and just find them because they're, they're cool looking and, and they're beautiful and they're colorful. Um, this is one that's really good to be aware of. This is the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Omphalotus olivacens is the species that we have out here. There's a different species on the East Coast uh, that's orange, much, much more orange. The one we have here is kind of this dull orange that fades almost to greenish gray kind of thing. And it's, it's an inedible toxic mushroom. It even has a compound in it that I'm pretty sure is carcinogenic. So don't eat this. Um, it can be confused with chanterelles because it has the same has decurrent gills and it's kind of orange, but it tends to fruit in large clusters on the base of dead trees, particularly oaks and hardwoods. Uh, but it is useful for dyeing fabrics. You can make a range of kind of I think green to gray to you know, yellowy orange kind of thing. Um, and they're bioluminescent. They're one of the most uh, easily seen bioluminescent fungi that are out there. Uh, it works best when you have a kind of a big old blown out mushroom, um, like this one in the bottom right here. This is from my friend Damon. Uh, and you can see this with the naked eye. You have to, it has to be pretty dark, but you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, and I've done that. I like took one home from the woods and put it in my shed and sat there in the dark for five minutes and was like, oh yeah, it's glowing. It's doing the thing. I couldn't capture it on camera. Uh, Dim is a little bit better with the, the long exposure than me, but um, it's pretty cool. So I want to also just briefly mention uh, some disturbance ecology. So I mentioned earlier that our bishop pine trees are being threatened by this cryptoporous fungus and this pine beetle, and it is just wrecking a lot of the, the coastal pine habitat. And I think one of the things that would control it would be fire, but we've been trying to manage our fires in a way that's not allowing some of the hab coastal habitats to burn. And so they're not purging the disease and, and that disease keeps getting worse. And we have a similar problem happening with sudden oak death and this uh, pathogen called Phytophthora remorum, uh, which is, I think, technically, it's not a fungi. It's, it's more like a little protist kind of thing. Um, I think of it as like malaria or AIDS for trees, um, which I know is not the best scientific explanation, but basically, it's a, it's a little protist that its host is in bay laurel. And if bay laurel is anywhere near tan oak, it will make the jump. And then it starts, it just really, uh, it tamps down the immune system of the tree and it can make a tree much more susceptible to infection 
with stuff like jack-o'-lantern mushrooms and armillaria and other fungal diseases that can take down a tree. And it doesn't permanently kill the tree because these tanoaks have a little sort of tuber in the ground that they can regrow from, but it's killing a lot of the old growth tanoaks and some of the, the really nice habitat. Um, so this is one of the things as you are hiking around, be aware that as you go from one area to another area, you could actually be a vector for this disease. So it's a really good idea to, you know, tamp your boots in a little bit of bleach water um, if you're going from an area that has sudden oak death to another area that's not effective because tan oaks are dying all across the state because of this disease and it, it's a big deal. It's changing the makeup of our forests and changing up the, the makeup of the types of mushrooms that are available. So, um, so this could be an intermission or it could be the end, depending on how much, how interested you guys are. But um, I'm open to questions and, and got a couple of tips here for you guys if you're interested in learning, learning more about foraging. Great, I'm always willing to learn more. Um, we did have some questions come in uh, through the chat. Gordon, would you like us to read them back to you? Sure, yeah, let's, let's do a couple and then sure. we'll keep going. Um, I think, Maricela was kind of keeping track. I'll pass it off to her. Okay, so um, the first one says, do the yellowfoots have hollow stipes? Yes, oh. yeah, all, all craterellus have a hollow stipe. So that's one of the things you can do if you're kind of questioning, is this a yellowfoot, is this a black trumpet? Rip it in half. If it's hollow in the middle, you'll mm -hmm. probably find a, a fir needle or a pine needle or something in there. Yeah, that is a distinguishing characteristic of craterellus. Um, it looks like Michael Crystala Selk is answering some um, of the, you yeah, know Mich him? Mikhail, yes, he, he is, uh, <laughs> he's taking care of it. He's good. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, um, Hiddenum oregonensis is the new name for belly button hedgies. There we go. Yep. Are there strong milky cap lookalikes? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what they mean by strong. There's a lot of different lactarius uh, here in California. I mean, the the two that people collect as edibles are going to be uh, Lactarius delicioso and Lactarius rubrolactans. Uh, and those are both, um, delicioso is kind of orange and has this like, or, like Cheeto orange latex that stains green and rubrolactans is a little bit more muted and orangey brown. And then it has a uh, latex that's kind of reddish and it stain also stains green. Um, so those are, those are the two edible ones. There's a lot of different species of lactarius that I don't know the names of, but they're generally inedible. And they're gonna have kind of acrid or bitter tasting um, latex. So if you, if you, you know, score the gills with your, your nail or a knife and latex comes out, A, you have a milk cap, uh, as opposed to something like a rustla, which would not bleed any kind of latex. Uh, the gills of a rustler are more brittle as well. So Rustlers are called brittle gills. Um, but yeah, the tasting the, the latex there can be kind of a, a giveaway or just looking at the color that that latex stains uh, will give, be a giveaway for, for identifying certain mushrooms or certain lactarius species. Okay, so that's all for the questions. So there's a couple of people who said, keep it going. <laughs> all right, we're gonna, we'll keep it going. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we'll, I've got basically that whole sort of first 30 slides there was what I, I put together for you guys. And then we're going to jump into a little primer on California polypores that I did for SOMA a couple weeks ago. So Mikhail is, a, is also a, a SOMA board member um, and is, I am not an encyclopedia of knowledge. I am, like I said, just, just an idiot with an iPhone. Um, Mikhail is a encyclopedia of knowledge. So if you have mushroom questions, feel free to direct them towards him. Um, I, I, before this talk, I had to ask him the name of a couple of things just to make sure I got it right. So, um, so I'm just gonna run through a couple of polypores and then um, we'll get into it. And actually here on the far right, there's, there's, there's Mikhail. He's uh, posing with a giant dollar's polypore that we found at, at Salt Point a couple of years ago. So, we're gonna learn how to recognize polypore mushrooms, right? We've been talking about Basidiomycota and most of the mushrooms, all the mushrooms I mentioned, I think were Basidiomycota. Um, and generally polypores are gonna be saprobes that are growing on dead wood or dying wood. And I wanna bring you guys attention to the idea of a preformed versus an indeterminate mushroom. So preformed mushrooms are majority of the ones we just looked at. They start life as like a little tiny version of themselves and then they grow. And when they're tiny pins, they have all the cells of a large mushroom, they're just tiny. And as the mushroom grows, the cells are just expanding. And so that's what's called a preformed mushroom is it starts life as a tiny pin and then it kind of just grows up. 
uh, the indeterminate mushrooms are mushrooms instead of that are going to grow out in series. And you can see that here with these sort of rings of growth, almost, you know, like you'd see on a tree kind of thing, but it's a mushroom that's growing opportunistically as the um, conditions are favorable for it. Um, polypores are generally pretty long lived. They're pretty persistent. So they'll hang around for a long time. They'll continue to disperse spores for a long time. And generally they're pretty easy to identify. Um, there's some really delicious ones. And there's some really interesting chemistry that uh, polypores do because they're long lived, because they're persistent. Uh, there's even, there's a mushroom called nagaricon, uh, which is a polypore that can live like 80 to 90 years. Um, but, you know, I guarantee you guys have all seen like an artist conch, uh, Organoderma brownie eyes, the species we have here, and those will hang around for years on end. Uh, and they have antifungals and antibacterials and other things like that that help them persist in the environment. And Paul Stamets did some pretty cool work here where he was looking at uh, extracts of different polypores and their effect on this virus that's causing colony collapse disorder in bees. Um, so he's got a project now where he's trying to take that extract and, and supply that to you know, people who have bee feeders so that we can try to help bees, um, not just around the country, but potentially around the world. And I know some of that stuff supply sourcing issues. Um, but I think that's one of the one of the good things that Paul Stamets is, is doing out there for, for bees. Um, so chicken in the woods. This is, for me, I find absurd amounts of this mushroom here in Napa. Uh, it absolutely loves to grow on the eucalyptus. It also grows on the oak trees. Although for me, what I see is that it probably infects like maybe one out of a hundred oak trees. And I see it on like one out of five eucalyptus trees. And that's, I think, because eucalyptus trees are invasive here and they don't have an immune system keyed in California and that makes it easier for this uh, this latiparous mushroom to invade and infect the tree. So this is a brown rot fungi um, so it's not white rot but it is brown rot so it's still causing issues with sort of the structural stability of a tree and the eucalyptus here in Napa are known for falling over all the time and it's a problem because they get too much water so they grow a lot faster than they should so they get really tall really skinny and then they get a fungus that rots out the middle of them. And it's really no surprise that it falls over all the time on the you know, cars and houses and vineyards and stuff. Um, but this is a, an absolutely uh, very easy to identify mushroom. If you see a giant lump of something yellow orange growing on a tree here in California, 100%, it is Latiparus gilbertsoni. Uh, you know, I, I get a lot of photos of this and I can always tell people with full certainty that this is what they think it is. Um, that being said, you can go wrong with this mushroom if you do a few things uh, sort of not following protocol, I guess my, the protocol that I've worked on for myself. It has a lot of oxalic acid uh, and a lot of polypores have oxalic acid in them, but this one particularly has a lot of it. And that makes it potentially toxic. Uh, so you have to cook it very well because heat is what breaks down oxalic acid. And if you don't cook the mushroom well enough, you can give yourself a fairly hefty dose of oxalic acid and a lot of people experience GI upset. Uh, that's, that's puking, that's vomiting, that's diarrhea, all the above, sometimes just upset stomach uh, from this mushroom. And so I am a really big fan of cooking this mushroom very, very, very well. And what I do as a general method is I will roast it for about 25, 30 minutes at about 375 uh, with just a little bit of olive oil and salt. And then I will do a separate breading and cooking step where I, I dredge it in flour, I put it in egg wash, and I put it in some breadcrumbs, and I season all of these things with porcini powder. So again, I mentioned porcini powder, but that's, that's where I get it, and here's where I use it. And I make these into little chicken nuggets, fry them off, and then I'll bake them again, sometimes with some like cheese and sauce on top and do kind of iterations of chicken parm. Um, so I really, I love eating this mushroom, um, but it, it really pays to be careful. So there's other species. It's not just Latiparus gilbertsoni. We have Latiparus conifericola. And so this is growing on conifers. Uh, in the Eastern part of the US, there's Latiparus sulfurus. We, we have the gilbertsoni species instead of sulfurus. Uh, and also on the East Coast, primarily associated with oak, there's Latiparus uh, cincinnatus, which is grows in these sort of rosettes and is more pinky. Um, and that's, I think that's actually my favorite flavored uh, chicken in the woods that's out there, but it's a shame that it doesn't grow here in California. Uh, we have the beefsteak fungus. So this is Fistulina hepatica. And here in California, this grows on chinkapin oaks or California wax myrtle. Uh, 
And I haven't really gotten good at finding these. I'm just kind of lucky that at my fiance's parents' house, there happens to be one big dead chinkapin oak. And every year there's been a beefsteak fungus on it. Uh, so I've been able to sort of robustly find and harvest this mushroom at least once a year. Um, it's another brown rot fungi and it's kind of pink spores. It's really hard to cultivate. The chick of the woods, you can buy plug spawn and you can get it to fruit. Uh, this beefsteak fungus, I think, has been more troublesome for people to grow commercially, which is a shame because when you cut it, it looks like beef and it's crunchy and it's delicious. Um, it has some oxalic acid too, although I don't think it's quite as high of a concentration as chick of the woods because you can eat small amounts of beefsteak fungus raw. Uh, again, I wouldn't eat too much because it's raw chitin and oxalic acid, but you can, you know, if you slice it very, very thin and you marinate it in some oil and some vinegar and kind of eat it like a carpaccio or something, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, underneath this mushroom has tiny little pores, almost like a bolete. Um, it's not actually really bolete. It's, I think it's related to schizophyllum, the, uh, the split gill mushroom that I mentioned earlier. Um, but this, these things are just so cool. They look like a giant liver or kidney growing into the side of a tree. Uh, and when they're really young, they can be like super red and bloody and like gooey and drippy looking. Um, they're, they're incredible mushrooms. And the flavor, as much as it looks like beef, the flavor is not all like beef. It's kind of a light lemony um, flavor, but it goes really well in, in tacos or you can you know bread it and fry it and do all sorts of stuff with it. So big fan of this mushroom. Uh, I'm just hoping I can figure out where to find it more robustly because I'm I still haven't figured out the habitat exactly. But uh, so yeah, it has it has a meaty look, lemony flavor, crunchy texture. Um, you can do sort of the, the raw car carpaccio preparation, like I mentioned. Um, it does have the oxalic acid, so you shouldn't eat too much. And you know, it's very satisfying to just cook it up and and eat it kind of straight up with some salt and pepper. So good good mushroom. Uh, lion's mane mushroom. This is a really really phenomenal edible mushroom. Uh, generally, it's, being, it's a white rot fungi that's going to be growing on hardwoods and oaks. Uh, I find a lot of this here in Napa. I know that it exists out in the coastal ranges, but I haven't necessarily found it in coastal habitats yet. Um, doesn't mean it's not there, it just means I haven't found it, but keep an eye open. Uh, it starts out very kind of pinky, almost coral looking, and as it grows, it, it gets a, a little longer in the tooth, as it were because uh, it has small teeth or spines instead of having gills or pores. And, you know, as it gets older and older, it, uh, you know, kind of gets a little more bitter, a little more crispy. Um, and you can cultivate this mushroom. And in fact, I just, I have a kit of a lion's mane that I just harvested the other day, and I got a nice, like, sort of two-pound lobe off this little kit. Uh, so you can definitely clone wild specimens of lion's mane, or you can order a kit, grow some at home, or if you get lucky, you can go out and find some on a tree. Although I would say that the wild specimens generally have a stronger flavor and the texture can be a little bit more uh, mushy and wet than the, the cultivated stuff. So, so yeah, it's kind of up to you. Uh, there's another great heresium species uh, called heresium corolloides. And you can see that down in the bottom right here that that one's a little more branched. Um, and that's really good too. People use that to, to make like vegan crab cakes because um, it has a very sort of crab seafood like texture um, flavor, not so much, but definitely texture-wise, it, it mimics some what you get from seafood and crab. Um, so it is commercially cultivated, like I said, and you, get, you can buy nice big lobes of it. You can buy kits from like Far West Fungi has kits, uh, North Spore has kits. Um, there's a lot of different purveyors out there that have, have good kits. Uh, the one thing I would say is if you're trying to, com not commercially, but if you're trying to grow this mushroom at home, you want to make sure that it stays very humid and pretty cool because that's where it's going to do best. You want to be between like 50 and 70 degrees and probably upwards of like 60% humidity. Um, so having a little tent and like a humidifier setup can help you keep the mushroom really nice. Um, it's really delicious. It's super tasty and it's a super versatile culinary mushroom. I have cooked a lot of different things with it. I've made tikka masala. I've made chili. I, uh, I cook it with like tofu and eggs sometimes and it has this really nice sort of slightly chewy texture with all the soft stuff. Um, I cook it all the time just because I have it and it's really good. Uh, there's a lot of hype around its potential therapeutic benefits. Um, it is supposed to contain some compounds that can help uh, enhance neuroplasticity. It's supposed to help with heart health and, and you know all sorts of cholesterol diseases and stuff like that. Uh, the evidence for that medical benefit is very much based on experiments that have been done in vitro. So that's experiments in a test tube or on a plate or maybe in a mouse system. 
but very little work has actually been done in human beings. And there's some serious doubt as to whether or not the benefits that are, are being sold as these sort of nutraceutical products, whether it's an extract or, or powder or pills or whatever it is, I have heard a lot of anecdotal evidence to say that it does work and a lot of anecdotal evidence say it does not work. Um, and from what I've seen from medical and clinical studies, there's been no actual evidence that taking any of these nutraceutical products has any positive health benefit. What I can tell you with full certainty is that if you eat a lot of this mushroom, uh, you will be healthier because eating a lot of mushrooms is just inherently good for you. There's a lot of healthy polysaccharides that feed good beneficial populations of bacteria that associate with lower levels of inflammation and mushrooms have no fat. So if you're cooking meat and mushrooms together, the mushrooms will absorb the fat from the meat and help your body digest it sort of more slowly. And they'll keep you full for a lot longer than if you didn't eat mushrooms. And it's also sustainability wise, if you can cut the amount of meat you're eating in half and add mushrooms to sort of supplement, you're gonna be a lot healthier and a lot happier uh, in general. So when people ask me, hey, should, what nutraceuticals should I buy? I say, don't. Just if you're gonna spend 50 bucks on a little like, you know, bottle of lion's mane, go and buy 50 bucks worth of lion's mane and eat it. Cook it for dinner, have some friends over. You're gonna have a better time and it's gonna be better for your health than just taking these, these nutraceuticals. Um, that being said, if you have a neurodegenerative disease or something else and you wanna try lion's mane, go for it. You know, it's, I, I can't promise it'll work, but it, it's probably better than nothing for sure. Uh, there's a cauliflower mushroom. And this, this is very high on my list of sort of favorite edible mushrooms. Uh, this is in the West Coast, we have the Sparasis radicata species. So this is gonna grow on conifers, dug fir and pine is what I found it on. Uh, it's another brown rot fungi. It has sort of a, a creamy spore print. Um, this very distinctive morphology, kind of curled, wavy, leafy surface. And at the base of it, there's kind of a, a, a you know a base or a stipe, and that's usually what's kind of connected to the tree or coming somewhere out of the ground. And uh, yeah, this it has an amazing aroma that's like hard to describe. You, you'll know it once you smell it. And occasionally, if you're out in the woods. Um, I've caught whiffs of it, but then not been able to find one. It, it drives me nuts because I'm just like running around all, all over the place being like, I can smell it, but I can't see it. And sometimes that means the mushroom is, is getting ready to fruit, but hasn't actually appeared yet. Um, and they, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You know, there's, there's a little one that Mikhail has uh, in the bottom left and there's a, on the bottom right, there's a massive one that I found in Oregon um, last, last October or no, not this year, but previous year. Um, and cauliflower mushroom is, I think, is one of the most incredible uh, culinary mushrooms out there because it has awesome flavor, great texture, and you can actually use it as sort of a noodle substitute. Um, so I've made, uh, again, this is a, a recipe that I borrowed from Chef Chad Hyatt, but I've made like a cauliflower uh, sparasis carbonara. Uh, you can use it to make beef stroganoff. Um, anything where you use like an egg noodle or any other kind of noodle, you can, you can plop this, this mushroom in and it's a gluten-free alternative, low carb. Um, this lasts a very long time in the fridge as well. You can probably get two or three weeks out of one piece of mushroom uh, because it, again, these are polypores that are meant to stay out in nature and not mold for many weeks on end. So they'll be fine in your fridge, you know, staying nice and cool. Um, I've also had it deep fried uh, with some blue cheese dressing and that was absolutely awesome. Um, unfortunately, I think that restaurant closed. So, but I'll have to try that myself. I'm hoping I can find some, some cauliflower mushroom and, and give that a shot. And there's one last polypore. Uh, this one is not edible. The other four were edible. Uh, this is Dyer's polypore or Phalaeus schwitznai. Um, and it grows on conifers. I see it especially in dug fir. Uh, most of the time, like this is one of those mushrooms you'll see all, all summer and into fall. Uh, and it's, it'll grow as like sometimes little tiny nubs and sometimes as you know, big splayed out shelves like this. And as it gets older, it turns brown. Uh, when it's young, it's sort of nice and felty and velvety. Uh, it's another brown rot, brown rot polypore, um, kind of white yellow spores. Uh, it's really inedible, hard woody, and it's potentially toxic. So even at this young stage, it's not something I would consider eating. Um, I don't think it's super toxic, but there's definitely nothing in there that I want to eat. Uh, and there's a lot of compounds that are associated with it being a long persistent fruit body, because you'll often find these as sort of black chunks um, sitting on the forest floor months later. Uh, and that's because it contains a lot of compounds that are antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti -cytoto you know, cytotoxic stuff. And some of those compounds are associated with pigments and colors, which you can then extract if you want to make some natural dyes. Uh, so people will 
soak this uh, with uh, a range of you know, changing the pH and changing the mordant, which is stuff you put into a dye mixture to help extract and fix the color. And depending on, you know, how you dial in your, your pH and mordant mixture, you can get very uh, different colors and beautiful colors, um, very vibrant colors out of, this, out of this polypore. And unlike some other dye mushrooms that are very dependent on when you harvest them, whether it's a young versus an old specimen, Dyer's polypore is pretty forgiving. So this is, it's a great starter mushroom for people who want to get into fabric dyeing with mushrooms because you know, you'll, you'll get something. Um, it's got plenty of color and it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna work as opposed to not working, so. Um, and one last shout out to one of my favorite mushroom phenomenon is gutation. Uh, this happens when fungi uh, are growing very quickly and fungi are catabolic in that they break down sugars and organic matter and they basically breathe and sweat just the way that we do. So they're producing CO2 and H2O and uh, gutation is basically mushroom sweat. This is, this is a mushroom working really hard and it's just sweating bullets and it's absolutely gorgeous. So I put some pictures in here just because I love it. Um, so anyhow, thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, if you wanna see more photography cookery from me, uh, check out fascinatedbyfunga.com. Uh, my website, you can, I'm also on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, I have a Twitter, I have a Pinterest, I'm on more forms of social media than I care to admit, even though I think I just admitted all of them. Um, but check it out. I, I really, you know, I get a lot of uh, pleasure from the feedback I get from people. I do this partially for myself and partially for others and, and really just have a goal of like trying to educate the world on mushrooms and make people in general less mycophobic and ideally more excited about the mushrooms that they see and find and hopefully more connected to nature and where they live as well. Um, because I think we all have a desperate need to be stewards of nature and, and try to support biodiversity and you know, support worldviews that will help us move forward rather than move backwards. So fascinating by fungi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yeah, so we did record this and Gordon, I'll get oh, it to cool. you. Um, as quickly as I can, and you can feel free to share it however you want. And yeah, we'll I'll see. I'll go on YouTube. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. Um, and then our next Peregrine Audubon meeting will be December 15th, as we prepare for our local Christmas bird count. Um, like I mentioned earlier with some updates, uh, the Ukiah Christmas bird count is December 19th. But yeah, yeah thank you again. Um, Gordon, do you wanna take some questions that may have come in here at the end? Sure. I, I just checked and I, I have this one question. Isn't schizophilum commune tiny? How much have you harvested to get a meal out of them? Yeah, schizophilum commune can be pretty small. Uh, generally, the ones that I've har harvested have been when I find slightly larger specimens. Uh, I think it's gonna be best if you find an area where it's really moist, it's really protected, it's got a nice big log and you're gonna get a larger fruiting body. Um, so I'm not gonna harvest anything that's like the size of a quarter, but maybe when I get, you know, like yay long, I'll tear them off. Granted, I have not harvested schizophilum commune when I've been finding lots of other edible mushrooms. It's kind of when I'm <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel. But you know, it's, it's nice to have a few of those species. Like I said, the Sewilla species are ones that I usually wouldn't collect, but if I'm not finding chanterelles and I'm not finding uh, bolites or other things. I'm like, well, maybe I'll pick up a couple of Sewillus and a couple of Schizophyllum commune just so I get to come home with something. Um, <laughs> if, if you are out there and you start finding a lot of chanterelles, don't spend your time picking the other stuff that's only subpar because when you get home, it's already enough work to process the good stuff that you probably won't process the bad stuff. And then you'll leave it in the bottom of your fridge until it turns into a moldy mess and you have to throw it away anyhow. So just leave it out in the woods when you can. And if you're sure you're going to eat it, then bring it home and process it. But <laughs> Wow. Well, I, there, there aren't any other questions, but I, I just wanted to say that I'm hoping that when COVID, when we have COVID all, whatever, when we can deal with COVID, I would love to have you come up and you could do a cooking class with the mushrooms sure. because you made me so hungry with all of your delicious recipes that you <laughs> <laughs> talked about. But it was a great talk. Thank you so much. I learned, I learned a bunch of things. It was fantastic. Cool. I'm glad. <laughs> right. I, I love talking to people and, and getting people excited about mushrooms. So you, you guys are the perfect audience. Great program. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much.
All right. Thank you very much, Gordon. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic.